All right. Um, good afternoon. Good morning, um, wherever your time zone is. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is the second workshop of our uh, workshop, workshop series on sex differences in circadian rhythms and sleep. Um, very excited to continue what we started last week. Um, today's focus is going to be a little bit different. I'll get to that in a second. Before we start, just a couple of sort of things that we I want to say. I welcome, of course, on behalf of the entire organizing committee, which contains uh, Tara Sandy, uh, Ines Tora, and Lillian Hunt, and myself. Uh, and of course, I want to acknowledge the funders uh, and supporters who've made this possible, which is the Wellcome Trust and the Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion in Science and Health Group. Um, just a couple of words on the code of conduct. Conduct, uh, we we are dedicated to providing a harassment-free workshop experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity, expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, religion, or any technology choices. Um, if you uh, are engaging in any of these uh, harassing behaviors, we will um, we expect to comply immediately. Um, if you are being harassed in some capacity, please notify us. Um, just a couple of house rules. Um, keep keep your mute, uh, speakers on mute and microphones on mute on all sessions. Uh, please wait until the end of each presentation to ask your question. And then the way we'll do the question, uh, the Q&A after each talk will be via chat, right? So uh, ask your questions uh, in the chat box and then the moderator will pick, the, pick those up and ask them on your behalf. Make sure to just ask one question. So that's really important. No kind of um, sort of multiple uh, questions in one question or sort of, uh, uh, you know, multi-part questions, just keep it simple, ask one question. Uh, we're pre -rec or we're recording this as we've done last time, and then make sure to participate also in the workshop part at the end of the, uh, of the, the third bit of the session. Um, last week we talked about differences. Um, we had two really exciting speakers at a workshop about known, known, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, Today we're going to talk about impact of uh, sex differences in circadian rhythms and sleep. Uh, we have two really uh, great speakers lined up, um, and then a workshop bit where we're talking. We'll be discussing or exploring a little bit how uh, we do research impacts uh, the findings. And then next week, to conclude our series, we have another workshop on understanding change, uh, where the focus is going to be on changing the research and landscape to be more inclusive. Um, just as a reminder, so we recorded the uh, session from last week, which you can watch on YouTube now. It's basically got the, the talks as well as the, the content, and we'll do the same thing uh, at the end of this workshop as well to upload it on YouTube. Um, just a little bit of, a, a sort of, of an overview of what we'll, do, what we'll do today. We have two speakers, Rhiannon White and Francis Levi, um, uh, talking about two aspects of uh, this of topic complex. Um, and then we'll have a short break, five minutes, and then the workshop bit uh, from 4.35 onwards or whatever your time zone is. Um, now, without further ado, um, so thanks again for coming. And without further ado, I want to uh, hand the baton to Tara, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Manuel. It gives me great, great pleasure to introduce Rihanna and White. Um, she did her undergraduate degree from Oxford and is now a final year medical student at the University of Warwick. And Rhiannon has done a lot of work on non-visual photoreception. Um, and currently she's actually working with Manuel looking at uh, the sex gap or sex bias in um, non-visual photoreception. And today she's going to present some of her findings on this. So without much ado, I'm going to hand you over to Rhiannon. Amazing, okay. Thank you for that. Okay, great. So thank you for that introduction there. Um, so yeah, I will be talking about the evidence behind a sex difference within research in human circadian neuroscience and why it is that we should care about that. Um, so first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, the funders, so thanks to the Wellcome Trust for providing the support for the project. Um, thank you to the organising committee um, and especially thank you to Manuel for all his guidance on the project. Um, okay, so first of all, why do we care about sex differences at all? Uh, this is a graph that we were shown uh, last week as well, and I think it's a really good illustration of why sex differences do matter. Um, 
So as you can see, it shows a chronotype as a function of age and how this changes. And if you compare data for the male participants, so the open circles, compared to the filled circles, which is the female participants, you can see that on average males do have a significantly later chronotype um, and that's significant for all of the shaded grey background. Um, so we've got another example here, so this is looking at uh, responses to light exposure and you can see that on the graph on the left there, so men preferred the blue enriched light compared to non-blue enriched light, so blue enriched is the shaded bar and non-blue enriched is the open bar. Um, but yeah, the, the women showed the opposite trend, so they actually preferred the non-blue enriched light. Um, when you look at brightness perception, you can see that for the male participants, um, they viewed the blue enriched light as significantly brighter, whereas the female participants actually didn't show this effect at all. Um, so you can imagine how if you had a data set where you didn't disaggregate according to sex, you'd find that differences like this were just completely overlooked um, or not fully appreciated. Um, and this also applies to more sort of objective measures. So the graph on the right there shows EEG activity um, and specifically frontal NREM slow wave activity as participants were sleeping uh, while they're exposed to different lights. And for the male participants, exposure to uh, blue and rich light while they were sleeping led to significantly more um, NREM slow wave activity. But that effect wasn't seen at all for the female participants. So again, something that if you um, averaged over all of the participants, you could completely overlook. Um, so knowledge of light and its effects on us has come a long way over the last sort of 40 years. So there's a really early example um, on the left of the ability of light to suppress melatonin. Um, and then on the right, there are really recent sort of aggregation of all the different studies and how light um, affects our melatonin um, and how it affects our sleep cycles. And we know from that that we need to focus on melanopic illuminance if we want to entrain and if we want to enhance our circadian rhythms. So as knowledge is progressing and as knowledge is improving, there becomes a greater scope for recommendations and for policy making to do with lighting. Um, so this here is uh, the CIE standard. <coughs> And this describes um, a set of guidelines and numbers, basically. So it describes the spectral sensitivities for calculating quantities relating to the non-visual effects of light. Um, so each, for each of the five photoreceptors, it sets down um, an action spectrum based on the numbers that we've seen um, that can be put into place when we're making recommendations on a sort of healthy light exposure. Um, and they also refer to the concept of melanopic EDI or equivalent daylight illuminance, um, which they elaborate here in their position statement. So they say a high melanopic EDI uh, during the day is generally what you want to keep you alert and keep you awake. Um, whereas for relaxing and sort of supporting sleep, you want a low melanopic EDI. Um, and you can see that this has potentially massive implications for things like um, domestic lighting um, and also sort of office place um, and commercial settings as well. And we know that standards matter. So historically, once standards have been developed, they can be very hard to shift and hard to change. Um, so here is phi lambda, which describes the human sensitivity to flickering light as a function of wavelength. Um, and this was standardized by the CIE in 1924. And this forms the basis for loads of sort of policy making and recommendations in terms of the optimal light exposure for human health. Now, when this was developed, there was a range of sort of database and studies that this could have been based on. Um, and it was actually based just on one of them. So you can see on the graph on the right there, the Hartman and Hyde um, data set, which is the upside down circles is the one that it was based off. So this line here is the actual um, function that was standardized by the CIE. 
But if you compare that to all of the data sets and look at the other results that are available, you can see that actually the, the standardized curve quite significantly um, underestimates our sensitivity to viewing and perceiving these lights at the lowest wavelengths. Um, and this is something that we know, something that we're aware of, but it's still something that is very difficult to change and we still rely on this CIE function, even though we know it's not the best representation of how the visual system actually works. Um, and this idea that we kind of, we create this data set and use it and implement it in everyday life um, and then are struggling to change that when we realize that the data set might not be the best um, sort of source of evidence to base guidelines on. It's something that you see a lot. Um, so a similar example here is the styles and birch color match matching functions. Um, and these are, they now form the basis for the cone spectral sensitivities, which was also standardized by the CIE. Um, so it's a really sort of important, um, well-used data set. Um, so the color matching functions, for those that might not know, you, you're sort of shown a light and you have to create another light that looks identical by modulating the, the color composition of it. Um, and that can tell us a lot about the, the cones and the cone spectral sensitivities. Um, so when they were doing this, they had 49 observers and of those 16 were female. Um, so the question really is, to what extent would you expect only 16 observers if you were selecting by chance alone from a, an equal sex distribution? Um, and according to the, the actual binomial statistic, the answer is it's very unlikely. Um, and you can be sort of statistically confident that this is an example of um, a sex imbalance. So the sex gap is everywhere. So this is a book called Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez. And it's a really good book, would definitely recommend. Um, and it basically is a big amalgamation of all of these different examples of sex bias um, and kind of an imbalance in sex data that is collected and what the implications of that are. Um, so there's a massive range of these examples. So from really kind of small things like the average size of a smartphone is too large to fit in the average hand of a female, um, which you know is a bit annoying, perhaps a bit inconvenient, but it also is seen in much more serious cases. So women make up only 25% of participants in landmark trials for congestive heart failure. And this is a theme that you can see across medical research um, and across many types of research is that you're sort of coming to conclusions and basing, um, basing treatments and basing procedures off of data that is fundamentally biased or does not represent the whole population in some way. Um, so then coming back to um, a topic a bit more relevant to the idea of light and light exposure. So you can see that the standard office temperatures are based around the resting metabolic rate of a 40 year old 70 kilogram male. Um, as often is the case when standards are being developed. Um, but it's well known that the, the female metabolic rate is a lot lower than this. Um, and the implication then is that actually standard office temperatures are around five degrees too cold for women. So the work Manuel and I have been doing has been focusing on this same idea of a sex data gap in research into visual chronobiology. Um, so we're essentially doing a review of the available literature and then looking at the number of participants and splitting it up according to sex. So just an overview, this is the search strategy that we used. So we got papers from three main sources. So first of all, we did a search of the Scopus database um, and ranked papers according to citation count. And then we set a cutoff, um, which was the minimum of 30 citations for a paper to be considered. Um, we also looked at three sort of relevant and recent review papers, which are listed there. Um, and also did a Cochrane search with the um, 
the search criteria that you can see there. So that gave us a total of 545 papers. Um, and then once we sort of applied the exclusion criteria, so things like only looking at the acute effects of light, only looking at human data, um, and so on, we were left with 180 papers that we reviewed fully. So these are just some examples taken from the method sections. So you can see on the left there, you have um, studies that focused only on male participants. And on the right is the female only um, participants. So this is the kind of data we were using. So first of all, we were looking at the sample size as a whole. Um, and broadly, we found that sample size increased over time. So more recent papers tended to have more participants. Um, so you can see that in the figure on the right there. Um, so if you do a, a regression on the curve, on the line itself, you can see that roughly the size is increased by about one participant per year. Um, but it's important to note that there was a lot of variance in that. And of course, there were many that didn't go with that trend. So then turning to the, um, the sex distribution now, um, we looked at the number of female and male participants as a proportion of the total number of participants where this data was available. So as a, an average of all of the proportion female values, we found um, 0.33 um, female participants. So obviously this is below the, the kind of equal distribution of 0.5. Um, this became more kind of striking when you look at the number of papers that studies exclusively male versus exclusively female um, participants. So whereas there were 56 that only looked at men, um, there were just seven that only looked at female participants. Um, and you can see that on the figure there with the big clusters at the bottom of the, the male only studies. Um, and then we were kind of thinking, well, why did they only choose to look at one particular sex? Um, you know, was, was there a reason for it? Um, but we actually found that looking at the single sex papers, only 14.29% gave some kind of justification um, for that choice of sample. So either that there previously hadn't been found any, any sex differences or that um, a lack of availability or something like that. Um, and then in the papers that did include a mix of both sexes, we looked at whether they used that information when they were calculating their statistics. And actually only 19.35% considered sex as an independent factor in their tests. Um, which sort of really limits the amount of conclusions that can be drawn based on sex specifically. Um, so then we were sort of curious to know, well, is this something you just find in visual chronobiology or is this a factor that is present across sort of circadian research um, studies? So we did an analysis um, of studies from the journal Sleep um, collecting similar data. So we selected papers um, according to five year intervals. So starting at 1980 um, and then working up in five year intervals up to nine, uh, 2019. Um, and of those collected total sample size um, and number of female participants. Um, and again, you can see that sort of a similar cluster just below the kind of 0.5 mark. Um, and you can see that there are lots of papers still that are focusing just on male participants um, and that number is bigger than the number just using female participants. Um, and then again we see the effect of year of publication um, on sample size, so a general increase over time. So moving forward then, so I tried to think about you know why we see these differences um, and then kind of linking them to what we can do about those. Um, so in particular, I wanted to highlight um, the first point there. So this idea that because of, sort of menstrual cycles, because of you know, exogenous hormones, contraceptives, that female participants are sort of more difficult to study than males. Um, so that was an idea that came up a lot when the, when the papers did 
um, sort of justify a single sex sample. Um, so I sort of suggested that the answer to this is in recording um, and in collecting data like menstrual phase, um, like contraceptive use. Um, and I think that it's important that we record this information so that it becomes a factor that we can control for rather than just a sort of confounding variable. Um, the other point I wanted to highlight is the third one there. So this idea of a sex balance within the study population. Um, so, you know, if your population of interest is a particular sort of medical condition or a particular sort of occupational group, um, you know, you may find that that limits the, the sex of the participants that you can recruit. Uh, however, this almost seemed to be counter to the results we found because actually the, the specific study groups tended to be things like, um, like migraine patients, depression patients, um, nurses um, or participants with menstrual disorders. And actually those were the studies that tended to be biased towards female participants. Um, whereas the ones that focused on male participants tended to either not have a specific reason or were perhaps um, focusing on an occupational group, um, which happened to be overwhelmingly male. Um, but I think either way, I think the, the key here is for um, any imbalances that are present to be sort of acknowledged um, so that this can be considered when you're thinking about applying the findings. Um, and I think the key is sort of tr transparency in why decisions were made and what the potential implications are. So just to conclude then, so the male and female sex are not equally represented uh, in research throughout the field of circadian physiology. And this is true both of visual chronobiology and also um, across other circadian research. Um, and this matters because we know there are sex differences in circadian physiology and without disaggregating and collecting data from both sexes, these are the kind of differences that are going to be missed. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody has questions, feel free to type in the chat and I will ask Rhiannon questions. Well, I have a question for Rhiannon. <laughs> um, so overall, do you think that the sex bias has sort of reduced over the 20 year period you've studied or it's remained the same? And the reason I ask this is when I came into the field, I sort of came in where it was important to include female participants in the studies. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, even today, I see a number of pap uh, papers I come across now and then where they just use male participants. And indeed, the reason often is that, um, you know, the female physiology in introduces more variability into the data set. But do you think this has, in your analysis, has this, has this changed over the 20 year period? Do you see sort of an increase in the number of female participants? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting point, actually. I think there could very well be an effect. Um, I think, you know, possibly on the one hand, because you see the general increase in sample size, you know, that in itself gives you more scope for having sort of more female participants. I think there's definitely more of a tendency for uh, explicit reporting mm -hmm. on the sex distribution. So I think the papers that kind of included all male participants and didn't refer to or explain, I think they do tend to be the, the older ones. Um, Although I think, as you say, there is still quite a long way to go um, and you still do get sort of unjustified or unexplained kind of uh, imbalances. Thank you. Right. OK, so we have some questions. <laughs> um, so this is from Nina. And mm -hmm. she says for a recent healthy volunteer study, they recruited equal numbers of males and females. 
And she said, we had twice as many females as males wanting to take part. Mm -hmm. Do you think sex bias in the respondents might be impacted by the sex of the advertised chief investigator? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. Um, it could well do. And I suppose potentially, you know, even at a more kind of subconscious level in terms of how participants are recruited, um, or even sort of the type of research that they're recruiting them for. Um, and I suppose it's important to think about when you are recruiting, you know, participants of a particular sex, you know, where, where are the best locations and how can you go about kind of reaching those? So I know lots of um, sort of university-based groups often rely on um, psychology students um, and at undergraduate level, they do tend to be predominantly female. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, here's a question from Ines. Mm -hmm. um, her question is, were there any differences after the NIH changed its funding guidelines? So I think somewhere around 2016, mm -hmm. they changed their funding guidelines. Yeah. Um, that's a really good point as well. I, I'm not sure specifically. Um, I suppose one of the issues would be that, you know, because it's so recently still, um, you know, perhaps there isn't enough data to fully to fully tell yet. Um, but yeah, that's that's very possible that there is becoming more of a shift and more of an awareness when sort of looking at recruitment. Um, here's a question from lots of questions. Um, <laughs> Let me see, let me go back to it. Um, there's a question from Sophia. The question is light preference between male and females and non-REM changes in males. Does that track in any way with sleep and alertness difference between the sexes? Do you know that, Rhiannon? Um, no, I don't know that. Um, I'm not sure, but yeah, it could well do, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'd have to look at that paper, unfortunately. Um, and I think I will go with a final question. Um, this is from Parissa. She wants to know if you came across any papers that show a sex difference in the rod cone density when you were looking at the visual coronabiology literature. Um, so potentially we would have uh, not looked at those. So we were only um, looking at sort of acute effects of light and they had to be human um, lab studies. So we were quite limited in, you know, the actual range of papers that we were looking at. So off the top of my head, I can't think of any, um, but it may well be that we would have excluded those papers anyway. Um, and let me look to see if there are any more questions. Oh, here's a question from Francis. Um, shouldn't sex and age be recommended to be studied systematically and jointly? Yes. 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 <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much, Rhiannon. That was a really, really interesting talk. Very nice. And I hand over to Manuel now to introduce our next speaker. Great. Thank you, Tara. Um, also, apologies to everyone who tried to ask the question earlier. I hadn't realized that I had disabled the chat function. So, um, sorry about that. Um, okay, it's my great pleasure to um, uh, introduce the next speaker, um, Professor Francis uh, Levi, or Levy, um, medical oncologist who has pioneered the applications of circadian rhythm concepts to cancer and cancer treatment specifically. Over his career, he's worked at the University of Minnesota, the University of Paris, and the University of Warwick. Um, as well as the Paul Bruce Hospital in Villejuif, uh, France. Um, his current research focuses on the impact of uh, sex on chronos, therapeutic effects and scheduling, circadian biomarkers for tailoring chronotherapy to the individual patients, and their integration into patient-centered telemedicine systems. So once again, it's my great pleasure to welcome Francis. Um, and we're very excited to, about your talk. Thank you very much for this kind of nice introduction and for taking uh, me uh, on uh, aboard on this adventure. Uh, I'm going to, to address the issue of, uh, of uh, sex determination of cancer chronotherapeutics. And basically, uh, I will be telling you uh, the story that uh, 
our research has uh, uh, encountered through its uh, development. So uh, the, the effect of, uh, of sex on the toxicity of anti-cancer medications has long been known. Here you can see uh, a few reports uh, dating 1995, uh, already uh, highlighting the fact that age and sex uh, would uh, exert uh, uh, adverse events uh, much more frequently and much more severely in women as compared to men with cancer. And this, has, this story has been uh, uh, going on and on, uh, as you can see here again, and uh, until now, until uh, a recent uh, paper that has further highlighted uh, this issue. And uh, in brief, uh, this is a very large uh, European uh, trial that uh, uh, consisted in the administration of uh, uh, chemotherapy with 5-Uracil, uh, which is an anti-metabolite drug, and uh, irinotecan, which is a topoisomerase uh, one inhibitor, which is a current uh, standard treatment for colorectal cancer. And uh, in, this, uh, in this retrospective analysis, it was uh, emphasized that there were, again, uh, much more uh, toxicity in women as compared to men, and this was much more severe, and this was true for all uh, target uh, system, the gastrointestinal tract, the subjective symptoms, the, blood, the bone marrow toxicity, etc. And uh, so the, the conclusion uh, that we already knew basically for the past uh, 15 or 20 years is that the same chemotherapy protocol resulted in more frequent and more severe adverse events in female as compared to male cancer patients. And despite this has been uh, uh, a knowledge for a long time. There has been absolutely no change with regard to the uh, dose recommended for uh, anti cancer treatment administration according to sex. On the other hand, uh, also uh, we know that uh, there are sex differences in the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of almost all the medications that are taken. Uh, explanation lie in the fact that the Many metabolic pathways are different between uh, men and women. And uh, it has already, uh, coming back to 5 fluorouracil it was already emphasized that sex and age uh, did uh, play an important role on the, the way the body is uh, eliminating uh, the toxic compound, uh, which is called the, the clearance. And uh, even, uh, uh, you will see that uh, more than 20 years ago, it was uh, reported that uh, the, the clearance of uh, the 5 uracil would differ between men and women drastically. So that the lower the clearance, the more the toxicity, the higher the clearance, the less the toxicity. So this could be an explanation of the differences between men and women. But on top of this, you see that there is a very large uh, circadian pattern in the in the clearance of the 5 uracil in men and a much weaker one in women. Now we know that uh, these uh, pharmacology differences are related uh, to these chronopharmacology differences are related to, uh, to two kinds of, uh, of mechanisms. The first one which takes place at the level of this of the cell and of the tissue, which involves uh, the molecular clock control by uh, the clock bimal one dimer, which is uh, regulating uh, an array of uh, transcription factors, which are critical in the uh, rhythmic determination of uh, the bioactivation, the detoxification, and the transport of the xenobiotics or, or, or medications. And on the other hand, we know that uh, our circadian timing system uh, is uh, rhythmically uh, regulating the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, and the elimination of the drugs through uh, the different organs. Now, we also know, and we have long known for a long time, because this is why I wanted to study this, uh, this field, is uh, that uh, the dosing time of uh, 
of many anti-cancer agents in rodents uh, do uh, impact uh, drastically on the toxicity in, uh, in mice or rats. And this has been long known uh, according to the, uh, to the time of administration, whether it is during the rest span of the mice or rats or during the activity span, uh, 28 anti-cancer drugs displayed uh, up to five-fold uh, less toxicity at the time that is indicated here. Not five-fold for all of them, but five-fold for, uh, for several, like 5-fluoracil, for instance. Nevertheless, almost all of these studies have been performed in male mice for the reason that was uh, previously emphasized that uh, uh, investigators usually consider that uh, because female mice also have a uh, estrous cycle, it could make things more complicated to have reproducible results. And so most investigations in uh, pharmacology at large and uh, in chronopharmacology uh, also have focused on uh, the male sex. But the question we are addressing really is how does this information regarding the optimal timing of medication translate to the treatment of humans? And as you know, unfortunately, in humans, you have male and females. And uh, so uh, the assumption uh, that has uh, been uh, leading the development of the translation, I would say, of the experimental data on uh, chronotherapy to the human uh, clinical studies is that because uh, mice are nocturnally active and humans are diurnally active, uh, you transfer by 12 hours. Uh, you have a shift by 12 hours, which in fact is a, is a quite valid assumption for many, many biological functions. Nevertheless, this does not consider differences between the sexes. Uh, I'm going now to, to focus on, uh, on uh, uh, colorectal cancer on, on the implications of, uh, of the chronotherapy and the sex differences for the treatment of uh, colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer is uh, the third leading cause of death uh, uh, in uh, the, the Europe, but also in the, U in the US and even in the UK, I should say. Uh, but, uh, and the main drugs again are 5 fluorouracil oxaliplatin and erinoteca, and the main chemotherapeutic drugs that are being used. Uh, the disease is deadly. Uh, when I started to work with, uh, to, to try to improve the patient's outcome uh, uh, several, uh, two, two or three decades ago, uh, almost only 5% of the patient were living beyond two years, uh, indicating that uh, it was really a, a disaster. And so uh, in, with our team uh, in uh, Paul Bush Hospital, we have uh, first chronomodulated uh, the delivery of the 5 fluorouracil and the covering to uh, deliver it at night, and second, added a new drug, which was oxaliplatin, and uh, design this uh, chronomodulated schedule. I think the time is short to explain why we did that, but there was a lot of uh, preclinical and early clinical studies that um, pharmacokinetic studies that led to this. Uh, Nevertheless, for the first time, uh, there was a, a major improvement in the anti-tumor efficacy of the chemotherapy in this disease. And of course, it was uh, difficult to uh, for our colleagues uh, to accept it, but uh, it has now been widely uh, confirmed that this three drug association has uh, markedly improved the outcome of, uh, of cancer patients, not necessarily with chronotherapy. And I will come to this uh, issue uh, now. So uh, basically, uh, we have uh, with, our, with our team and uh, many others that with whom uh, uh, we have been actively collaborating. We, there had been uh, 14 uh, clinical trials uh, testing the chronotherapy concept in uh, nearly 1,700 uh, patients uh, that have uh, first led to the first demonstration, uh, whether or not it was chronomodulated, of the efficacy of oxaliplatin 
it was the first demonstration of the efficacy of the three drug combination. Uh, it was the first demonstration that indeed you could cure metastatic colorectal cancer by combining the chronotherapy with the surgery. And uh, uh, but the question uh, that remained was uh, uh, what, is, what are the respective roles of uh, chronotherapy and, uh, and this new drug that had been added? And so there were several uh, randomized international uh, trials uh, that involved uh, many cancer centers in 10 countries. But to make a, a, a long story short, uh, we performed, uh, uh, so we demonstrated that there was a, a nearly a five-fold reduction in severe toxicity of this uh, treatment uh, by uh, chronomodulated delivery, as I showed, as, as compared to constant rate infusion. And we then, our group was wondering whether there would be an impact on survival. And we performed a randomized study in a very large uh, patient uh, sample. Uh, and we found that there was indeed no difference in uh, overall survival, but this is where, when we discovered that there was a major sex schedule interaction. And uh, because we found this major sex schedule interaction uh, had a major impact on the survival of the patients, we performed a meta-analysis of uh, three uh, randomized trials that was conducted uh, by our group on a large uh, patient uh, sample. In principle, it is a comparison of a chronomodulated administration of, uh, uh, of, the, of the same three drugs at the same doses versus either a constant rate infusion of the same three drugs or uh, a random, uh, random timing administration during daytime of the same three drugs as it is used uh, in current practice. And uh, the purpose of the meta-analysis was really to, to see whether uh, there would be a, a sex, and a, a role of the sex, an interaction between sex and schedule on the survival of the patients. And so these are the median, uh, these are the median uh, survival uh, data in the, in the female or in the male patients. Uh, and you can, uh, you can see uh, two things. The first thing is that uh, male and female patients have uh, basically the similar median survival uh, if they receive the conventional chemotherapy. But male and female patients have a drastically different outcome if uh, they receive uh, chronomodulated chemotherapy. Four months is, uh, is a maximum uh, difference that you can ever observe in a randomized clinical trial. So it's a huge, it's a huge difference. And uh, uh, what even is more uh, uh, important is that uh, while uh, in males there was a clear benefit of chronotherapy in terms of survival, uh, in males it was the opposite indicating that uh, the timing was uh, likely to be wrong. Uh, these differences that are found on, in overall survival, we, they were found for each and every efficacy endpoint that we measured in this study. And it was also true, uh, you can see that chronotherapy was better in male patients in each of the three international trials that were performed, and of course, in the meta-analysis as well. And so uh, this effect was totally not anticipated in any of, uh, in any of our trials. But of course, uh, they, they, are, uh, they are very, very solid because the sex schedule interaction was a completely independent uh, factor for the outcome of the patients. Moreover, you have uh, major differences in toxicity that I already mentioned for the uh, combination. You see the conventional chemotherapy here, the chronotherapy here. You have more toxicity uh, in the hematologic toxicity 
uh, in the conventional therapy, both in men and in both in men and in women, as compared to chronotherapy. But you clearly see that you have a tendency to work more uh, improvement with chronotherapy in men as compared to women. The question then uh, that came to the fore is that are we able to identify a better uh, timing in women as compared to men? And again, this is a retrospective analysis of, uh, of uh, another uh, randomized uh, trial where we uh, administer the same uh, regimen as before, but instead of giving uh, the, the treatment at the same time to everyone, some patients receive uh, the, the peak delivery of the, of the drugs at one time of day, others received it three hours later or three hours earlier, six hours later or six hours earlier, nine hours apart or 12 hours apart. And we looked uh, primarily at the toxicity of the treatment. So this is basically the different uh, schedules that were automatically administered with the pump. And you can see, uh, you can see here that uh, the, the incidence of severe toxic events, the proportion of patients with severe toxic events on, uh, on this regimen, depending upon when the peak time of uh, drug delivery uh, occurred. Uh, this is the reference schedule that I showed before, and these are the different schedules that are shifted uh, plus or minus three, plus or minus six, plus or minus nine hours. And you can clearly see that uh, for those patients receiving uh, the treatment at uh, what we expected to be the best time based on uh, animal, based on prior uh, animal experiments, you had almost uh, no toxicity. And it was also very good uh, for the six uh, hours preceding this time. And then you can uh, you see a major increase up to 60 or 70 percent uh, patient with toxicity if you are 12 hours apart. This is in men, but in women, you see it is not the same pattern. And basically, uh, we feel also limited by the number of, of patients in this study. But basically, there is a suggestion that women would tolerate this treatment better six hours later than men. Now, uh, to continue the story, uh, there is a new drug, another drug that was introduced in the treatment of colorectal cancer, which is called irinotecan. It's a complex uh, metabolism uh, in a way, but in any event, today, uh, the combination of irinotecan with the three drugs I mentioned before is considered to be one of the most active, uh, although toxic, combination. And we wondered whether there would be a, an optimal timing for this drug. And so this was also the topics of a, of a clinical trial that uh, uh, we performed again in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, where, where the, the timing of enotecan uh, was uh, randomized to occur between uh, 9, uh, 9 p.m. and, uh, and uh, 10 a.m. Uh, in the morning in patients, and uh, sorry, and, uh, and 20, 9 p.m. and uh, 17 uh, and 5 p.m. So you had six different uh, timing of, uh, of the delivery of Erinotecan that was combined with the same chronomodulated chemotherapy regimen that I mentioned before, and it was a fixed timing. And the question then was, uh, uh, does toxicity in this patient differ and can it be improved by a selected timing of irinotecan? And uh, the answer at the level of the whole population was no. But uh, again, when we looked uh, at the differences between male and female patients. Uh, you have here uh, two major toxicities of uh, the regimen, which is the decrease in, uh, in white blood cells and uh, the loss of appetite uh, in male patients. You see that you have least toxicity 
at 9 a.m., significantly least toxicity at 9 a.m. And in women, you see that you have significantly least and almost no toxicity if you deliver the drug at 3 p.m. And uh, if we uh, compute all the circadian patterns in toxicity, you can clearly see that uh, there is a six hour gap uh, between uh, a six hour difference, sorry, between the timing of uh, best toxicity in men, which is early in the morning around 9 a.m., and the timing of least toxicity in women, which occurs around uh, 3 p.m. So this is the second uh, example of, uh, of this. But why did we do this uh, retrospective analysis? It is because in a European project that uh, I have been uh, coordinating, uh, we had uh, examined uh, the relevance of irinotecan timing uh, according to sex. This was one of the many aspects of this uh, project. And you can see in mice, so it's a large study involving a large number of mice, because the purpose was really to be able to differentiate optimal timing of irinotecan in female versus male mice. And you can see here the toxicity. The toxicity is the body weight loss. The deeper, the worse the toxicity. And you can clearly see that uh, females have a, a large toxicity uh, at the beginning of the light span and least toxicity uh, around uh, 15, uh, around ZT50. For male mice, least toxicity is at ZT11 and, sorry, least toxicity is at ZT11 and you can see that the magnitude of the change is much larger in female as compared to male. These two features really, they, they are quite well recapitulated in the results of the clinical study I mentioned. You have a major timing related difference in toxicity in women, uh, a weaker one in men, and there is a six hour difference, as I mentioned, in the men, as uh, between men and women uh, chronotoxicity which is quite uh, similar to what we are seeing in, uh, in the mouse uh, studies. Now, just to highlight a, a recent result that, uh, from Swati Kumar in, in Warwick, uh, she has uh, explanted uh, ileum. Ileum is a, is a, a target uh, toxicity organ for irinotecan, and she has measured the uh, PGP uh, uh, expression using a, a special uh, uh, PGP fluck uh, mice, mouse that we are breeding. And uh, this uh, means that if you uh, expose the, uh, this explant uh, in cell culture, in, uh, in culture dishes with luciferin, you will have a rhythmic expression of the protons over several uh, days. This is what you see for male ileum, and this is what you see for female ileum, indicating again that there are marked differences in the amplitude of these rhythms. And in, as conclusion, I would like to, to emphasize that uh, in cancer patients and in rodents, optimal drug timing, like optimal drug doses, can differ according to sex. Uh, in cell line, we don't know. It's never been looked at. Uh, large differences in treatment effects can be expected according to dosing time in both sexes in patients and in rodents, but it has to be sex specific. The mechanisms seem to involve some molecular clock uh, regulate, regulatory aspects, but they may also involve uh, hormonal, metabolic proliferation and uh, other cycles and sleep as well. So uh, we feel that more dedicated mechanistic studies are needed. And finally, uh, a proposal is uh, that there is, uh, for the chronotherapy, there is probably, there should probably be two uh, different uh, schedules to be uh, proposed in terms of timing of these three drugs between men and women. This is a trial we are 
currently uh, discussing, but of course there, are, there is a clear need for prospective clinical and translational trials, including a careful attention to the sex, not only as a stratification factor, but as a determinant factor. I want to thank my collaborator in Warwick uh, and uh, in Villejuif and uh, in Italy, in, uh, in Portugal, in Turkey, in Belgium, in uh, Norway, and in Canada, with whom uh, these uh, studies uh, were performed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francis, for this uh, really wonderful uh, and quite comprehensive presentation over um, chronotherapeutics. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, if, if so, please write them in the chat. But one question coming in immediately. Uh, Nina is asking, interesting data, Francis, thank you. In the mouse studies for repeated measures on body weight, are the male and female mice being weighed at the same circadian phase for each measurement? Uh, yes. Great, <laughs> quick, quick answer. Um, we got one question from Maxime in the slide with data from mutant mice. Uh, if the tissues were explants in culture, what could underlie the differences between samples from males and females? Because there's no hormones in the medium. Uh, in the study that, uh, that we, we performed where, where we investigated the uh, male versus female optimal timing of irinotecan, we did do an uh, investigation on, on uh, uh, 27 circadian uh, expression uh, patterns in liver and in uh, ileum, and uh, we did uncover that the only predictive, dif the only factor that predicted for the optimal timing of the drug was the uh, circadian pattern in uh, reverb alpha and bimal one uh, mRNA. And so this, uh, there was a clear sex uh, dependence uh, in both tissues. Of course, this will need to be uh, further scrutinized, but uh, our explanation is that the clock is not, uh, work, the molecular clock is not working similarly in the two tissues. Great. But that's a, that's a hypothesis I want to. Great, thank you. Um, we got one, a couple more questions. Um, is this uh, chronotherapeutic approach also applied for other cancer treatments? Uh, it is applied, uh, it has been applied for lung, lung cancer, it has been applied for head and neck, for kidney, uh, for breast, not to a large extent, I would say, uh, but of course now that we, we know so much more about the, the impact of the clock on the pathways of the drug that we have now tools that are uh, allowing us to really map the chronopharmacology mechanism and highlight which ones are the most relevant. Uh, there, is, uh, there is room now for, for uh, much, many more clinical and experimental studies. Great, and then one final question before we go on the break. Um, Deborah Skeen is asking, uh, or oh, saying, thanks Francis, lovely talk. You didn't mention inter-individual differences. Would these be smaller than the, than the sex differences? Okay, no. <laughs> uh, I think there are two, uh, two kinds of uh, differences. Uh, there, there is <clears throat> most, uh, the one I was discussing was the sex differences, but of course you have also genetic and lifestyle related differences. Uh, the, the good thing is that uh, we are now with the telemonitoring uh, systems uh, and more sophisticated molecular uh, and artificial intelligence analysis, you are able to track uh, intersubject uh, differences uh, more precisely so that you can uh, tailor uh, chronotherapeutic delivery uh, to the sex. I think this should be done because there are already very, very clear results, but of course you can go f one step further with the individual. Perfect. Uh, thank you again uh, on behalf of the entire organizing committee for this really wonderful talk. Thanks, and I'll uh, hand over to Lillian, possibly. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you. So I, let me just, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have got a break scheduled in at this point now for everyone, because I know that we've all been online for 
some of us a bit over an hour and it's always good to have a little bit of a um, stretch of the legs so let me just pop this screen up so people can see where we're going to be next so what i'm going to be running in this second part is a workshop um, session with some interactive questions and polling and some discussion points around that um, it's using the program Menti, so you can go on menti.com and use the code 380611 and then we'll go through the questions one by one and I'll talk everyone through that process as well. But what I think is a good idea now is if we take a couple of minutes, I'll just say sort of three minutes. So my clock currently says 132. If everyone can come back for 135 and then we'll start the workshop section as well. Um, this was really useful last week, so please do stick around for it and we've got some feedback as well at the end. Um, so yeah, if I just leave that for three minutes, go stretch your legs, get another couple coffee or tea and some water or something and we'll meet back here and uh, yeah just log on and make sure that works fantastic so what i'm going to do is i am going to run the second half it's an excellent question that we'll come to as well joint relevance age and sex for impactful research i will make sure i make a note of that to comment at some point in this in this workshop section um so for this section here, we're thinking about the impact of how we do research. And just as a bit of a background for me, I, my name's Lillian Hunt. I work at the Wellcome Trust. I'm the program lead for EDIS and run the organisation, which is a coalition of organisations within the science and life, life science and health sector, um, all committed to equality, diversity and inclusion. We've got two sort of main topics that we've been working on over the past year. One is around inclusive conferences and events. And the other one is thinking more about the actual inclusive research practice and design element which is which, which fits in very well with this workshop um, last week we spoke about um, knowing the fact that sex differences exist and then in the workshop we explored some other differences that we uh, acknowledge could impact research outcomes in this field and sort of slightly wider as well and then now that we've seen uh, today's talks i just want to thank the speakers rihanna and francis these were fantastic talks to demonstrate that not only do we know sex differences exist we know the field is in balance as well and also now we can see the real impact that that can have on people and in health interventions as well um, so i think it's really important work and i'm really pleased to be able to talk about this with you and also to think about how we address this with both within the field but also wider as well so just so you know, as we go through the questions, um, some of the information that um, some of the polling data we'll use in the write-ups of these workshops. Um, and we'll also make sure that we share all of this information with you after the three workshops as well. So all of these slides, once we've finished closing off the polls and things like that, they'll get shared back out with you. There was some really interesting stuff last week around the differences um, that were identified. And also this week, hopefully we'll then th start thinking about the impact that these differences can have in how we do the impact of how we do research as well. Um, so I'm just going to leave this on just a little bit longer just to make sure that everyone can log on and make sure that the polls work in. I recognise that we have um, quite a few people who are participants who aren't on this yet because I can see we've got sort of 43 people on this page so far. So if you just press the little thumbs up like button in the corner, it'll let me know that you're here as well. And then that way I can know sort of roughly when to move forward with each slide based on the number of um, responses that have been collected. Um, so some of the stuff that we want to think about in this part of the workshop is the impact of the decisions that we make when we design our research um, the impact of the research itself and also the impact of both inclusion and exclusion of different participants in research and that can be thinking all the way back down to sort of fundamental um, discovery biomedical research all the way through to patient and participant involvement within research as well and I'll be calling on one of the other organizers Inez later on to talk a little bit about um, patient and public involvement and engagement too um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Just take a note, we've got sort of at least 57 people involved in this bit here. So the first question is the same as last week, but I've also added in clinician scientist as an option. So basically, we just want to understand who's here for this workshop as well. What, so what best describes the work that you do in your current role? Um, there's a spelling incorrection on there. So um, hopefully, yeah, so I'm glad that people are choosing clinician scientists. We added that in as a result of feedback last week. This is really useful because as we go through this, we're going to be talking about research specifically, but also we're going to start thinking about when we move into next week as well what activities and actions that people can personally take and also what isn't in they need to enable them to take a different approach to their research as well um, so yeah it's really interesting again lots of people primarily doing research some more people in the clinician scientist area last week we were definitely missing people from the funding section and i think we'll probably end up sort of doing that for the this workshop and next week's as well 
but what will be really interesting is when we think about the enablers that we need in order to improve the inclusion of different sexes different genders in our research and other differences as well I mean, we might actually need those funders to give us the support as researchers to do that work so it's always good to think about how how that can draw in um, as mentioned in one of the questions earlier NIH for example changing their funding policy is quite a driver for inclusion of sex as a biological variable in various pieces of research Brilliant. So I think I'm going to move on to the next slide. Now we've got 58. So we had 57 in the last one. Um, if anyone is still joining and wants to join in on the polling, the information is at the top of each slide. You can still join in partway through. It's not. This isn't. This isn't an incredibly scientific sort of piece of research when we're doing this. This is more to try and increase the engagement between us all. Um, so last week there were several traits that got mentioned and. Uh, differences that can be influencing the research outcomes of various pieces of research. So last week we asked for what sort of factors could influence research outside of just sex and gender as variables. Now I've taken from that word cloud some of the most mentioned um, items. So thinking about chronotype, age, mental health, genetics, socioeconomic status, epigenetics, family or childcare backgrounds and ethnicity. And what I really wanted to see was sort of where people span these in terms of how much of an impact biological aspects are to these differences and how much of these are based on social cultural factors. So hopefully everyone should have a little slider for each of these items and you can slide between sort of I think it's one and five to sort of decide how much is towards the biological end of the spectrum and how much is towards the social cultural end of the spectrum. What's really important to do with this is understanding where these fit will help us understand how to account for these differences when we're doing research because we have to really think about this and when we're going through this work do we want to uh, control for these differences do we want to stratify our patient populations in order to be able to answer these questions better or do we want to take a different approach where we want to include a wider variety or a wider diversity of people under these different groupings so that our research at the end could be more relevant to everyone. And we've seen kind of both sides of the spectrum here. We've seen some areas where sex difference is, you know, an important factor. So therefore we should make sure that we are in some way accounting for that within the research we're doing or controlling for it, or at least investigating that difference. But then there's also other factors as well where by doing that, we're seeing the sex bias in the data we're doing because we are primarily sort of attuned to just choosing male or men as our primary sort of focus. So we have to realize how to balance that out. We also don't want to ever overemphasize differences either. And I think there was a really important point that got made last week, I think it was by Paulina, about how we're exploring differences, especially sex and gender differences in these workshops, but we don't ever want to have these differences used for discriminatory behaviors. This isn't about trying to create reasons to not include certain groups in policy or planning or something like that further down the line. It's more to understand how we can either enable people to make better choices for themselves or enable policy and practice to better serve the whole population. And really understanding where people are included and excluded in all of this is really vital to this. What's really interesting here is that you're seeing quite a bit of a, a range between some of these. And that's really interesting because I think there's a lot of things that could be put under either of those categories, depending on how you break them down. I've kept each of these categories quite broad, though, so I know that beneath that there could be some specifics. What we then think about then is if lots of these categories were selected as both either in the factors that we know affect um, circadian and sleep research, but also some of them in the areas of place uh, in the second question we had last week, which was around what would you like to look at or think is important, but don't know how to study. You know, it feels like there's a block or it's too difficult or it's too, uh, there's too many categories within that. And I think that's kind of a really fascinating point to think about when we, th when we think about socioeconomic status, for example. How would you measure socioeconomic status within a study and how would you then relate that back into the research you're doing? Is it ethical to do these things as well? And I think these are all questions that we can ask as researchers with each of the steps. Um, there's a question saying, I think you could set up questionnaires within Zoom. You can set up questionnaires within Zoom, sort of basic polling things, but there's a few more complex questions that we're doing uh, as part of this process as well. Also, this enables us to capture all of this data in various ways as well as PDFs, but also imagery. So I promise you, I did look at Zoom as a polling option, but this is uh, allows us to do a lot more things. 
okay so yeah i think this is really interesting when you think about things around um ethnicity is one that i really wanted to point out at the moment so ethnicity itself the categories that we use are culturally and socially defined however there is also we're thinking about the crossover between ethnicity classifications we use socially and genetic ancestries which are more based on sort of you know a long lineage of genetic history within different groups the problem when it comes to ethnicity is that we are often using ethnicity or race classifiers in replacement or by proxy for genetic ancestries and this can become quite this can create quite a cause of a, a conflation and leads to some level of biological sort of fundamentalism around differences between population groups. Now, I really recommend, if you haven't read anything by him, um, Professor Ewan Burney, who is one of the directors at Ember EBI, has spoken quite a lot around how we need to move on within genetics specifically and thinking around ethnicity, race, and genetic ancestries and how we are mixing those sort of words up when a lot of the time we don't mean those things. Um, and also thinking about how we can sort of understand the influence of genetics, but not on a continent basis, because at the moment we're not really seeing those patterns that we are uh, describing a lot of the time in personalized medicine, but there are still very important genetic aspects that we need to look at. So I really recommend um, Professor Ewan Burney's writings. He's done quite a few Twitter threads, I think, on this uh, topic as well. Um, so what's really interesting about these is now we're thinking about all of these different traits. If we start including all of these different traits and looking at differences within them, within our research, what could our research lead to? And I think um, Francis Lee, Francis' talk earlier was really interesting because it really shows a connection between sex differences of, at your basic level and understanding the impact that that then has on health interventions and health outcomes. So the next question really is to think about sort of big ideas now. If we were to do research in this field in across any of these traits, what could that influence? And I thought that was a really interesting um, points as well in the first talk around uh, policy and uh, around the uh, recommendations for light um, in sort of offices or buildings and things like that. So this should hopefully be a bit of a free text box and I think you should be able to submit multiple points on this and we'll collate them all. And the idea is that I would turn this into sort of a thematic sort of analysis at some point. So, you know, things around, if we understood this research, recommendations in policy what sort of policy recommendations could come out of this research and this is this can be broad you don't have to know you know what direction these answers are going to be at the moment but just what what things could happen so i think one that was earlier around um the actually actually around the timing of therapeutics i think that is you know that's something that is definitely would would go under this field there's other things around um thinking about could this influence technology? Um, could this influence uh, personal behaviours, recommendations for behaviours around exercise, sleep, around things that you would do in your daytime, around when you eat? You know, there's lots, lots and lots of things that could through here. Personalised circadian lighting, yes. Clinical outcomes, lots of things around personalised and precision, precision medicine, really good, brilliant. Child neurodevelopment. Um, the treatment around adverse effects. I'll leave this to come on through a little bit and I'll sort of scroll through them as we go as well. Um, environmental health, yeah. Individual working hours, yes, I think that's a really, really important one to think about, chronic diseases development. Working times, countermeasures you use, more around precision diagnostics, yep. Yeah. How to design trials that because of financial constraints cannot study large number of people and therefore not include diverse population yeah i think that's really important you know if we can if we understand the differences and we're able to sort of use them already when we design studies then we're more likely to have better outcomes at the end guidelines around indoor lighting yeah uh, standards documents guidelines recommendations shift work road to planning transport it's lots of brilliant stuff around precision medicine as well and treatment specifically um Thinking about sort of in the immediate term as well, you know, this, like we saw earlier, some of this information is already being turned into policies as it is. Thinking about the long term, you know, what things could this research then lead to, which then leads to something else. Wonder, you know, if there's things around um, how we build buildings, for example, so they've got suitable natural light coming through into them. Um, time effects and insurance premiums. Yes, that's definitely something that could, could happen and could come up that we need to make sure we understand. 
Um, the anecdote from last week was thinking about um, the cycle, uh, the menstrual cycle with women who are shift workers and how um, their wake time was affecting uh, reaction time. And actually the decision points that will come out of that sort of knowledge would be for a woman to maybe choose different behaviors in the lead up to her night shift. So for example, having more coffee or better naps or something like that, you know, and this is this all this information would all enable those choices and those decisions. Um, what's interesting is actually when we're thinking about specifically around sex differences is that a lot of this work that hasn't been done as shown in the first talk today feels quite like low hanging fruit now and it feels like there's not much additional work and you know even you can go back through old data sets to look for sex differences that could affect some of these things and could then lead to um, further changes in policy and practice and recommendations and guidelines the impact of parenthood on sleep and circadian health for example would be an incredible piece of work to then give recommendations to new parents for example which could genuinely change how parents behave or how they co-parent and if we don't sort of include some of these differences and understand sort of the, the expanse of where this research should go, then we're potentially doing ourselves a disservice. So I'm going to move to the next slide now, um, thinking about influence um, and moving on to um, barriers to including different people. So we understand now that we have a sex bias within the field. We understand there are sex differences within several traits within the field. We understand that these can then lead to changes in treatment plans, in policy and recommendation and standards. But sex differences aren't the only differences that we were identified. There was obviously a lot of others as well. When thinking about your research and thinking about research involving people specifically, we now want to kind of investigate and interrogate why there isn't the same level of uh, equality amongst inclusion of different people or different groups of people. So what I've done here is creating sort of a sliding scale for you to consider each of these groups of people and try and figure out where the barriers exist. Is it because as a researcher, it's difficult to understand how to include these groups of people, whether that's in your analysis or in the actual practical implications of your research, but also then thinking about it from a participant's perspective. As an individual who sits in one of these categories, are there barriers to being involved in research that, you're current, that could be currently faced? Um, so an example of that would be, um, so, outside of this field completely but thinking about um, neuroscience uh, specifically there was a piece around mental health research and um, there was a piece that was done by Wellcome Trust thinking about the patient journey into mental health research and being a participant in mental health research and they followed the patient journey all the way through and found that there was a huge shortfall of um, black participants within the mental health research when they actually then interrogated that further they found that even if someone managed to get through a large number of structural barriers and cultural barriers right at the very end in order to participate in the research, they needed to have something attached to their head for um, measuring, I'm not entirely sure what it is, because I'm not a neuroscientist, but for measuring, I'm gonna say brain waves, and we all know that's not what I mean, but that's the only word that can come to my head right now. It was impossible to attach these to someone with Afro hair. So that is an actual barrier that pretty much every single black person faced when trying to participate in that research and that's without even considering the sort of underlying unconscious biases that were causing problems prior to that moment what's interesting here is thinking about so i think believe the furthest arrows are more difficult i think to participate i'll just double check my um slide section yeah so so the furthest arrows are the sort of the harder to participate so you can see sort of in this we're seeing that women thinking about the gender uh, sex and gender within a binary for sort of here it's not too difficult to think of reasons why we can't just include both sexes in research or ask questions around sex and gender specifically i think there was a slide last week talking about all of the data that you can just by default collect when you're including um, women in trials around um, contraceptive use hormonal use and things like that what you find is there'll be some, some other aspects that could feel harder. So um, considering, let's say, uh, people with disabilities or disabled people, um, depending what the disability is, that could cause a huge structural barrier for a participant to be involved in research. But as a researcher, does that in fact 
impact the research you're doing? Is that actually going to have an effect on the outcomes you're looking at? Or is it just that there are a few additional steps of accessibility that you should probably try and think about in the way that you design your study in the first place? that could then allow that person to be a part of the research. This one's a, it's quite an interesting one when we think about disability because a lot of the time there's a large number of comorbidities that come with disabilities. And a lot of the time when we're doing anything around sort of clinical trials or um, participants in research, some of the first questions that you ask a participant would be around disabilities and comorbidities. And often that means that someone is excluded from a trial or excluded from a piece of research straight away. But we never really think about why we're asking those questions sometimes. A lot of the time it's kind of a default state. And actually, there's a large number of studies that could include participants with various disabilities or comorbidities. But it's just because the default form asks for this that people are not included. So there's other sort of small areas of behavior change that could also happen at this point. Um, just on a note on the question that got put at the beginning around sex and age working together. So I've included all of these as individual traits. But obviously, we understand that everything is intersectional and no one person is just one thing. So when we consider this, one of the ways that we can kind of start thinking about how we reduce barriers is to design studies or design research that is accessible or inclusive for the most marginalized person first. And often what we find is that once we do that, a lot of other characteristics then get to be included as well, even if we're not specifically designing for them. Um, and it's, it's a method that we can use quite su successfully. But what's really useful is when you then have someone from one of those marginalized backgrounds involved in designing that with you. And then you will often find the barriers that you would not have seen. You know, as a white woman, there is plenty of barriers that exist for, let's say, a black woman that I would just never see straight away or be able to think about or comprehend because I don't have that same lived experience. And the more we're doing research, the more that we're understanding that lived experience is quite important in some of this design. Um, so I'm conscious of time at this point. So I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Thank you, everyone who's filled that in. It's really useful to sort of see. And that'll create sort of almost a hierarchy of how we start thinking about the next stage in the next workshop as well. Um, so now I just wanted to quickly bring in um, Inez, who is um, at UCL. So Inez, if you're able to switch on your mic as well. I thought that was a really good point now to think about um, your experiences as a researcher involving patient and public involvement and engagement as a way of including people. Um, so you have done this before in your research, if, if everything is yeah. to be believed. Um, and I just wanted to sort of draw you in to talk about sort of how that went about and some of the benefits that you found for involving patient and public. Yes, yeah, so, um, well, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Ines uh, Pineda and I work on uh, gene regulation in, in cardiometabolic and immune diseases. And lately we're interested in sex differences in the mechanisms that are involved in these diseases. So we've run a, a few of these um, patient and public in involvement uh, events. And um, uh, I hope that in five minutes or so, I can convince you that these are, can, these are very useful and can be quite powerful. Uh, not only because it's something that at least in the UK, charities giving funding uh, are asking more and more, but also because it can have uh, quite an uh, important impact in, in the way you do research and the, also the impact that your research can have in, in, uh, in people. Um, so we've noticed that by running these events, it, it can really affect how we design and we, how we can prepare our, our applications, but also how we design our, our research. Um, and how we design the projects, because we really want to know what's important to the patients. And very often that not, we think that something that's very close to, to us and our particular pathway that is going to be the most interesting thing for them, or actually they couldn't care less. <laughs> um, so it, it helps identifying the gaps in, in, in how we want to understand, uh, in our case, uh, a disease. And, um, and it can result in, in something that, uh, and research interests that are better aligned with what the patients feel that uh, is most uh, important to them. And that is where also here it's important to, uh, to, to think of 
different sexes or different ethnicities, if that's something that is applicable to, to the disease or situation uh, of interest. And we often see that this is a two-way uh, street scenario. So it increases awareness in the, um, in the patients in terms of how uh, the, the research that we um, show is, is seen. But on the other hand, it also, for, for us, it's very powerful to see what the patients' are, um, uh, thoughts are and, uh, and increases our awareness of, of their reality. So often, I'm a basic scientist, and as basic scientists, we're often quite far away from interactions with, uh, with patients. So it's very important to hear that perspective. And actually, this, this was the number one thing that uh, when we surveyed the feedback uh, and impact on, on our events, uh, came across as, as well, in, especially in the early career researchers in, in, uh, in the group. Um, and we've seen that we can use different platforms to, to run these, uh, these events, but, and we uh, usually do uh, social media surveys before, um, and we can then analyze the, those surveys and share the results of those surveys during the, uh, the event. Uh, also, it's an important thing to uh, think about is that we can publish those results, both the results in the events of the events and also the results of the of the surveys that we run prior to the event. So uh, we have done in, in some peer reviewed journals and sometimes we can also publish them in, in charity newsletters. And I guess uh, last but not least, uh, publicizing your events in, in social media or in other platforms can gain the attention of other charities or interesting parties that you didn't even had in mind and, and can sometimes result in, in interesting collaborations. So for example, we run one of the surveys we run was for uh, the impact of nutrition in, uh, in lupus patients. And, um, and as a result, we, that, that, that uh, online survey got caught by Lupus UK and they were in the process of revising their guidelines, uh, their nutritional guide, guidelines to, the, um, uh, uh, to lupus uh, patients. So we, we're involved now in, in the redesigning and, and giving uh, more up-to-date uh, information. And that was not uh, at the beginning something that we had in mind, but it was just a, a serendipitous um, impact on, on, on the type of surveys and, and the events we run. So, um, so it, it can have often unexpected uh, impact uh, uh, as well. And uh, finally, just a, a couple of things on, on the considerations that you need to uh, bear in mind when you're uh, running this uh, and you're planning this event. event. Um, do not do not underestimate the time uh, that that it, they need to you know. Uh, it, um, to, to get prepared and bear in mind, as, as Lily was saying now, uh, the mobility and also other needs of, of the patients. So this is this may not be your usual seminar workshop. And for example, we we had we were running workshops uh, with patients that had uh, serostomia or, or dry mouths, and we had sandwiches. And we we saw that uh, the uh, actually most of the sandwiches were left, and then we realized that actually the food that we were providing was not at all in line. Uh, with the, the patients that were attending the event. So, so that's, that, that was quite uh, useful. Consider the diversity, whether you want to have different ethnics, uh, ages and, and sex represented in your patient group. Um, and also uh, understand the limits of, of the impact that you're going to have uh, with, when you're dealing with certain cohorts. So for example, we ran some uh, some um, events with uh, young cohorts or adolescents and some of the eating behaviors, we recognize that they depend more on the parents and the adults they live with them than themselves. Um, so I hope uh, this has given you some food for thought on um, what things that you could consider when, when running these events and how beneficial are actually incorporating uh, these events in your overall planning of your research questions and your research. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Inez, for sharing. Really appreciate that. And I think uh, some of you have seen the slide that's come up nicely at the same time, which is if you were to then do this or do this work involvement, but also the idea of redesigning some of your research um, 
practice or sort of the way the methodology even as well to be more inclusive what things will help enable that for you and that could be that you need some more personal learning or it could be that you need to find wider pools things like that and you can see this is coming up as a workout so as things are said more often they'll be larger as well but this will be really useful because next week we really want to spend this workshop session trying to pin down those real those actionable items that we can all go away and either do individually for ourselves or that we need to petition other people to help support us with so for example funding is a huge one but i'm really pleased to say um, that welcome trust have just agreed for inclusive um, research design and practice to be a goal for the entire organization's funding um, by 2030, I believe it is. So um, there's ten, two year goals, five year goals and 10 year goals behind that. And that's a big piece of work that I've been doing with the diversity and inclusion team to get that embedded both as DNI objectives, but also as a whole objective as well for the organization as part of its newest uh, review. So there'll be more information around that and sort of how funding can come from organizations like Welcome, like you know, UKRI and trying to figure out making sure that that support is enabled. And as Ina said, this takes time. It's not quick. It's not easy. Sometimes it is complicated. But to be honest, I don't think we're at the point now where we can use complicated as, as an excuse for not doing it, um, especially when we see health inequalities being um, made larger or gaps being grown wider as a result of doing the same sort of thing. This is really great information. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hold that slide there and move on to the final slide, which is just a feedback slide for us so we know how this session was. Um, we have the same questions for each of them. We're not expecting the same answers for each of these sessions. And this isn't just the workshop. This is the whole with the two talks at the beginning as well. So if you could just fill that in on your way out, that'd be really useful. This has been absolutely fantastic. And again, I want to thank um, our speakers Rhiannon and Francis um, and the other organizers Tara Manuel and Inez for your support in this as well as everyone else who's written in for questions as Manuel said this whole thing's been recorded we've kept all of the inf uh, all of the questions and things like that and we're going to be able to write this up in some format that's really useful hopefully for everyone at the end of this so I think on that note I get to say goodbye and thank you we're only six minutes over which bearing in mind last week finished on time I'm quite pleased with and um, thank you everyone who's been joining us from different time zones as well obviously it's quite difficult to organize something that works for everyone so yes feel free to fill this in and then head off thank you so much everyone <laughs>